Every trip that I go, besides the actual trip, I always come back with the message that Hashem wants me to figure it out. And uh, whether you know or not, this trip I didn't want to go to. There was a trip, if you follow the trips, June was London, that if you remember it, many problems happened before and after, the back, the car, the wheels exploding. Then July was the East Coast, and August was the West Coast and West Coast of America and I really did not want to go on this trip and I already promised my daughter Rivka that she's gonna come with me and I was really about almost about to cancel the trip already and she went a couple days to my parents and I told my wife you know what I'm gonna cancel the trip I don't want to go and I called my daughter and I told her if I will cancel the trip Will you be very, very upset and disappointed? And I was like, I'm gonna base my decision on what she says. And she says, yes. Meaning she's gonna be very upset and disappointed. So I was like, okay, I guess I'm going. And from, I would say 12 hours prior to the trip, till I came back, anything and everything that can go wrong, went wrong. This was like one event after the other of challenges, problems, you, can, you, you name it, this trip had it. And the finale, the grand finale of the trip is that I got stuck in Miami in the hurricane. I wasn't even supposed to go to Miami. The trip was concentrating on the West Coast. I was the majority of the time in Los Angeles, then another five days in Phoenix, and that's it. The trip was supposed to be over. And last minute, they call us from some place in Miami. We want the rabbi to come to the uh, lecture. I have a girl that runs the events. And she says to them, no, I'm sorry. I mean, he's in the West Coast, he can't come. And she asks me and I tell her, you know what? It might not be a bad idea after all because I'm gonna be in the West Coast and it's a very long flight, 16 hour flight direct from Los Angeles to Israel. And if I fly to the East Coast, then I'm cutting the flight a little bit shorter. And I'm already on the continent. And if they're so uh, uh, interested in bringing me and the community must, must hear me, then fine. So the lady that runs the events, she tells the lady who requested, the flights are already set. If you're willing to pay the penalties to change all the flights, and the difference in tickets, then fine, we'll make it happen. And that's how I somehow got into the whole Miami uh, lecture, which <laughs> even when it came to the lecture, we changed all the tickets, everything was changed. And you know how many times these tickets were changed? The <laughs> I think maybe seven times my itinerary changed. Elal is probably like, what's going on with this guy? Very undecisive. That doesn't know how to decide. One time he's flying here, one time he's flying there. I, I think I'll, I'll make money on me just on the changing on the tickets all day long. Baruch Hashem, I'm holding like the status in El Al. They have like different statuses, like platinum, uh, whatever, because I fly all the time. I have a good status with El Al, so I'm, I'm, uh, I, I, I don't pay high penalties. Long story short, originally, the first Shabbat, I was supposed to have a Shabbaton in, in uh, Houston, in a community in Houston. And suddenly, two weeks before the, the Shabbaton, they canceled. And the, the lady that runs the event, she was like, what do you mean you're canceling? I mean, uh, I mean, we have already tickets. I mean, the whole schedule is based according to the Shabbaton, and not only that. I mean, what do you think? The, the rabbi is coming to America to, to do shopping and to go on tours? Every day here is calculated. Now, he's, we're not going to get a, a different community to organize a Shabbaton in two weeks. So now he's just going to be sitting there for doing nothing. And I told her, listen, that's Hashem's will, just, it's fine. 
And sure enough, that weekend was the hurricane, uh, what's his name, Andrew? What's his name? I forgot all the names. No, Irma is uh, Miami. Harvey. I don't even know who's the one who's sitting and inventing the names. I mean, I wonder the job, the job specifications, you need to name hurricanes. Who's the guy who's naming the hurricanes? Anyways, Harvey, Schmarvey, whatever the name is, that's when Harvey hits Houston, and Houston, you know, became an, un uh, an underwater city. And I was supposed to be there for Shabbaton. This goes to show you how Hashem, you know, he, he moves whoever he wants, whenever he wants. So, so this whole Miami stop wasn't even supposed to happen. And the, the, the fact was that even after that was booked, suddenly they call and they say, we can do Tuesday, can you do Wednesday? And, what do you mean? Oh my God, the, the flights again, they're all booked already. Again, it moved. So anything and everything that can go wrong in that trip went wrong. I mean, every day was a whole new episode of something. So, Bezad Hashem, like I told you, there's, uh, I have now material to Hanukkah to talk about. Hashem was literally testing my, my, my uh, abilities in belief, in emunah, in bitachon, in prayers, in patience, unbelievable patience. Hashem really, t you know, all the options He put on the table to test them. But, and Baruch Hashem, I mean, spiritually the trip was unbelievable. Every day there were lectures, big, big lectures, thousands of people were inspired. Spiritually the trips are always amazing. But I'm not talking about the, the physical part was the, all the challenges. Spiritually it was bemet unbelievable. And, and I saw physically with my eyes why in every station I had to be. The thousands of people that attended classes and lectures and between the morning has classes, the night has lectures, in between the meetings. So I saw why I was needed there. But the things that, that really, really struck me the entire trip, because a lot of people tell me, told me, why do you think Hashem is doing this to you? Why is He putting you through all these tests? and all these uh, headaches and problems that you would think that you're going on the mission of Hashem, you're going on His shlichut, on His, uh, 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 you're His emissary, why wouldn't He make it smooth to you? That everything is smooth and convenient. So, one of the things that I, I took from that, and that's what I actually understood on the first day of the trip, because I really did not want to go. I had this heavy feeling that I don't want to go. And everything, and every day that something happened, my voice was like, I knew it. I shouldn't have gone. And every time something happened, you know, even when I came back, I mean, the last week was really the, the, the cream of the crop. To get stuck in a hurricane, and, you know, when I landed in Florida, then I started hearing about the hurricane because everybody was going wacko there. Everybody was going cuckoo. And everybody's going cuckoo and my daughter and me are like, hey, what a beautiful place, we're in Miami. And <laughs> it's not a beautiful place. They have like 5,000% humidity. It's not, not normal, this place. You just stand outside and, and, you, and you lose five pounds. I, I lost maybe 20 pounds in Miami. It's unbelievable. At night, 12 o'clock at night, it's just, you, it's just, I don't know how people live there. I do not know how people live there. And anyway, so my wife is telling me, did you hear? There's a hurricane, run away from there. I said, don't worry, hurricane, shmurricane. The hurricane is, scheduled to come on Saturday. Uh, my flight is leaving on Thursday. I came here, don't worry, I'm gonna do my lectures and I'm gonna leave. And no, they, they announced that they're closing the airport on third Friday night. I was, had full confidence that Thursday morning, why would they cancel my flight? I can understand if my flight was Sunday. The hurricane, the scare was that it's supposed to hit Saturday night. I have Thursday, I have Friday, I have Saturday. Why should I leave, not leave? 
And sure enough, then my, my, my flight, I had a lecture on Wednesday night. I finished the lecture, maybe one o'clock, I come home to start packing. And I go online to check in and I see the flight is canceled. And, now, and there were nine flights from JetBlue in the morning, just mine got canceled. I was like, why mine got canceled? And I was like, okay, I try to get a different flight. There were zero flights. And the only flights that you can get at, the, at that moment was like $1,500 for a small flight. And now what happened, I was stuck in Miami Beach. And the, the house where I stayed in, they, they fled for their life. So they called, I mean, the lady that was organizing the event called me and told me the house where you're staying, they, they're running away. You have to go and take your stuff. So, and I said, yeah, but I'm in Fort Lauderdale. I can't come now. They actually packed all our stuff and they took it to a different place because they just boarded the house and left. So I went to a different house and that house was also, everything was boarded up and they told me no we're leaving in the morning and then they wake up in the morning and they see that i'm there because i missed my flight and the guy tells me why are you here i said because i missed my flight i mean i didn't miss my flight the flight got canceled so he tells me you gotta run away i mean we are in miami beach miami beach is three feet above sea level and the warning was 11 feet of water above sea level so meaning the whole place is going to be underwater and and I was like, okay, I can't have any flights. What are my options? Okay, let me drive out of Miami. So people told me, don't even think of driving because there's no gas. The whole state of Florida, there's no gas. Everybody drank it. I don't know what they did with the gas. Everybody's filling up their ca cars and gas tanks for their generators. There wasn't any gas. The people told me, don't even think of driving because you're gonna get stuck on a highway. You're not gonna have gas and then you're sleeping in a car. Besides the fact that the ones who did run away reported sitting 12 to 16 hours in bumper to bumper in traffic. Can you imagine sitting 12 hours in a car? I started calling hotels. We called maybe 100 hotels. There was maybe five people calling for hotels. We couldn't even get a room. There was no rooms. So the guy where I stayed by, he told me, listen, I'm an engineer. I know how the hurricanes work. You have to move west of the I-95. Anything that is east of the I-95 will get hurt, and the buildings, they stop the, the, the wind. Anything west of it is like a corridor where it's a safe place. Long story short, I'll tell you about the whole Miami story another time. That's, that's literally a, a, a whole story in itself. But I lost, I missed the flight. And I found a safe place to stay. I was like, okay, fine, if Hashem wants me here, he wants me here. And it ended up being that, yeah, I, had, I gave more lectures. On Shabbat, we already lost power. There wasn't any power already on Shabbat. And it was Chai Elul, the birthday of the Baal Shem Tov, the birthday of the Baal Atanya. It was the day the Baal Shem Tov was uh, revealed, the, the day that the teacher of the Baal Shem Tov revealed to himself, revealed himself to him, the Achiyah Shiloni, the day that the Baal Shem Tov revealed himself. It was a very special day. So uh, where I stayed, the closest shul was a Chabad shul. So I went to pray there. And th that was the only place that had electricity because they had a generator. So I, I, I mean, there was a lot of people there. That's when it all started already. And, uh, and I already saw why I had to even be there. I, I, I spoke at the shul, I, we gave lectures there. We were, but the point was that Shabbat morning, we already lost power. So there wasn't any electricity. And in the beginning, it's fun for the first three hours. And that's, that's when it stopped being fun. And, and of course, my daughter was very scared. And not only that, there wasn't any flights going out. All the flights were canceled. Long story short, I will tell you, Bezrat Hashem, about the adventures of the, of the hurricane. Which, you know, right away comes all the analogy of the hurricane. The name of the hurricane is Irma. And if you write Irma in Hebrew, it's Aleph, Yud, Resh, Mem, He. That has the letters Yare, Mehashem, fear God. And, and of course, everybody started coming with all the analysis of the names and everything. And I don't know if you noticed that the path, how it went, looked like a shofar. You saw that? Yeah, I did. So anyways, there was all these miracles. But the point is, 
that I, I, don't worry, I will share with you all these stories of unbelievable miracles and how Hashem does things for, for you to see His greatness. But really what I realized in this entire trip, and I realized it the day that I left, because the day that I left, I called a cab to take me. That's how it started. I go online to see when is the train, because I always take a train to the airport. I go online to see when is the train leaving, and there's big signs, no trains. There's construction, there is no trains. So what's my other option? A taxi that costs five times more than to take a train. Okay, no other option. I call around, anybody going to the airport, and I had five suitcases. I take with me all my CDs and all the flyers. It's much cheaper to do it here. Okay, I can't find a ride, okay. I have to take a taxi. I call the taxi, the taxi can't come and take me because it was the Kleisner. Cars cannot come into the city. <laughs> so, so, so that's how it started. I have suitcases that I had to roll down, all the way down to, to, to Lelov there, because the taxi could not come in. <laughs> so that's how the trip started. And of course, I, I, minutes before I'm checking in, I'm getting an email from El Al, the flight is delayed. And the trip didn't even start it. I, ha I can't leave Tzfat and the flight is delayed. Long story short, that's when I already realized that Hashem is not consulting with us of our opinion. Hashem is not asking what is my opinion in the situation. He's not consulting, is it comfortable for you? Do you want to be here? Do you want to be there? You think sometimes that Hashem is considering our desire, my will, my opinion. That's when I realized Hashem is not asking. Hashem did not consult me, do you want the trip to be comfortable or not? Hashem says, I need you to go to point A, to do A, B, and C, and I'm going to decide the agenda, I'm going to decide the, how it's going to happen, and you just have to follow along. And that's when it hit me in the beginning of the trip and I said, oh my gosh, this entire trip is going to be about Hashem proving to me that He's not consulting with me about anything. He's not asking me if I want to take a night flight, a morning flight, if, I should, if the flight should be with a stop, without a stop, when is the date that I'm coming back? I set the date for September 8th. And Hashem says, no, the trip is ending on September 14. You made a mistake when you booked the ticket. So I'm going to have to make you stuck in Florida because there's going to be another five lectures that you need to do there. So this is where I realized in a very humbling way that Hashem puts us on a path. He has a mission for each and every one of us. And he says, this is where I want you to go. This is where I want you to go. This is where I want you to go. This is what I want you to do. This is what I want you to do. And happens to be that I'm not even asking you if you are happy with the route or if you are happy with the job I gave you. You know, now I came back, uh, I gathered all my kids and I told them, okay, there's going to be some changes in the house rules uh, ba based on many new uh, uh, information that I have, we're changing some of the house rules. Okay, what are the changes of the house rules? I said, you all have chores in the house. And I'm going to add now chores to your curriculum. <laughs> some of the chores, you're going to have to do it because you live here and you're part of the system. Some of them you're going to get paid for. That way you can earn money. And I am going to decide who is doing what. So my daughter says, please, please don't let me fold the laundry. The, uh, my, the other son says, I don't want to water the garden. They know that there's different chores. And the other one says, I don't want to do this. I said, listen, I'm not asking you what the chores you want. I am going to dictate who is going to do what based on your talents based on your availability and based on my decision. And if I decide you're going to water the garden and you're going to take the garbage out and you're going to fold the laundry, that's my decision. And 
some of the chores you're going to get paid for, some of the chores you're going to have to volunteer your time. You live here, you have a bed, you have a, a, somebody doing the laundry for you, you have food, you have supplies to school, you have toys, you have to do, pull your end. And the same thing Hashem does for us. Doesn't matter who you are or what you are, Hashem says, I need you to go there right now and to deal with this annoying person. And that annoying person is going to drive you nuts. That's what I need you to do. Stop complaining. And you, I need to send over there and you're going to need to deal with this situation and it's not going to be fun. And you're going to be screamed at and you're going to be yelled at. That's where I need you to be. And I need you to go over there and I need you to go over there. Hashem says, I'm not asking you right now. I'm not making a vote who wants to do what. Because if I'm going to make a vote, nobody will raise their hand. So I decide who goes where, who's going to have to deal with anything that I want you to deal with. And the entire theme of this entire trip was Hashem telling me, in other words, I organized your trip, not the girls who are helping you organize your trips, and not the trip manager, and not El Al, and not nothing. I organized the trip. I will decide the stops, how long you're going to be in every stop, which flights you're going to take, where you're going to eat, how you're going to eat, because of all these changes in the flights, half the flights, they couldn't even give me kosher meals. Even the flight when I came back, I'm going to, Bezal Hashem, maybe choose I'll tell you the story, how, what happened when I came back. It was not normal. Anything, literally anything that can go wrong, went wrong. I lost my passports on the connecting flight. I mean, I forgot my passports on the connecting flight from Fort Lauderdale. I, I couldn't find any flights. I grabbed the first flight that I could from Fort Lauderdale to Boston. Why Boston? I don't know. Hashem wanted me to be in Boston. I had, to, had a half a day layover. And I forget the passports on the plane. There's no such a thing that a, any airline will go, let you go on a plane without your passports. I forgot my passports on the plane that took me from Fort Lauderdale to Boston. In the pocket inside. No? You have to hear the whole story. You know what? I'm the last thing that I am. I mean, I have many things that I need to work on. One thing that I can say on myself that I'm not, I am very organized and I'm not a schlumpiel. I don't forget it. I'm not a schlumpiel that forgets things around. I'm like a yeki, like a machine. Everything for me is like organized. I don't forget things. I have lists. Everything with me is with lists and reminders. I have a pouch where my passports go in that when they go out, they go in. I don't even know why. That's where you see how Hashem sometimes, He presses a button and He resets your system. I don't even know why I was holding the passports. I didn't even need the passports. And I went on the plane with the passports. And I don't even know what possessed me to put them in the pocket in the seat in front of me, and I forgot them. So anyways, I'll tell you the story with the passports because that's an insane story that you see how Hashem orchestras a situation to then see how you're going to react. And if you react the right way, He performs a miracle. And you have to hear that story. That's the story that I shared on Friday. It's a funny story, Bezal Hashem maybe will do it on Tuesday. But the point is that I always come back from these trips with a message that I, uh, that I need to understand. And if I need to understand that and I understood it, it means that I need to give it over. And the point is that as much as Hashem is amazing, Hashem is wonderful, He's a loving God, He gives us what we need, but there's one thing that He doesn't do is that He doesn't consult with us, what do I want? Sometimes he's like an airline company that says, do you want an uh, aisle seat or do you want a window seat? Sometimes maybe he will give me the option. But you know now with all the times that I change all my flights, I didn't even have all this, the say. I told them, can you give me an aisle? We're sorry, we don't have tickets. When I flew out of Miami, when out, out of Miami, when I was on the call with a guy, he told me, you have this option, that option. I told him, even if you tie me with duct tape to the wing, I don't care how, just get me out of here. I don't care if I stand the whole flight. Fly me to Uzbekistan. I don't care. Just put me on any flight. 
you have, even if I have to sit on the toilet the whole flight. I don't care. Aisle seat, not aisle seat, the seat in the back, I don't care. So, and that's another thing that sometimes Hashem pushes you into a situation that you say, I don't care how, just get me out of here. So in this trip, Hashem was proving a very deep concept in our life that Hashem is not consulting with us on anything. He's not asking me if I need to be comfortable, if I want to be comfortable. If Hashem puts me in an uncomfortable situation, because Hashem says, deal with it. I want you to work on your patience. I want you to work on your gratitude. I want you to work on your prayers. I want you to pray and tell me you're not comfortable. And when I help you, I want you to be grateful. So, Bezad Hashem, we will talk about all the adventures of the trip. Uh, in this trip, I can't say that that's the case because I was, uh, Hashem was obviously in my case in this trip was putting his foot down and saying, you are nothing. You are, I'm talking about me, not you. I'm telling, I'm telling, them, I'm telling you what the message that what Hashem, Hashem, we do know that. But in this trip, Hashem ironed me. <laughs> He made me this flat to tell me, I don't, even if you think, you, even if you think that what you're doing or how you're doing was supposed to, Hashem was telling me, I run the show. And this trip was not convenient, not comfortable. There was nothing comfortable for me in this trip. I mean, here and there a few good moments and nothing was convenient in this trip. Hashem is basically was really taking me like this and telling me, it's not about you being comfortable, you're going to actually be very uncomfortable, but you're still going to put your best, you're going to put the best of your time and your effort. I don't want to hear complaints, I don't want to hear whining, I don't want to hear anything. You are hired to do a job, say thank you that it's you, because some jobs are very bad jobs, and some jobs are very prestige jobs. And you know how Hashem, Hashem is unbelievable. Hashem is so amazing. I am really going to tell you so many adventures that I had in this trip. At the end of this trip from hell, which again, chas v'shalom, I will not refine, define it like that. That's my wife's definition, the trip from hell. Then it was really, it took a toll on my family. It took a toll on me. I'm eating, you know, it even took a toll on my luggages. All my luggages are broken. I never seen anything like it. All the luggages broke. First of all, I had five suitcases they all were overweight I, they're all broke physically broke i couldn't even take the luggages because the one luggage the handle broke the other luggage got b torn in the bone my luggage even t took a toll and i was literally at the my last breaths coming into to 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 to, to Tzfat. and it's it's you know i traveled five days without four days without electricity no showers no sleeping no nothing eating apples and flying to Boston, half a day layover, 12 hour flight to Israel, and then I'm in Israel for a two hour train ride. <laughs> and after a two hour train ride, and after a two hour train ride, an hour <laughs> car ride from Akko to Tzfat. It's like it's like the never ending story. <laughs> so, as the. the, <laughs> the, the yeah, but again, you know, you're done with the flight. Let me just go home, sit on a train for two hours with five suitcases that everybody's like, excuse me, excuse me, can you move your luggages? No, I can't. I can't leave my luggages in the airport. I need to take them home. And everybody's like, but your luggages, they're... excuse me. So come, comes almost the end of the trip and I'm standing on the platform of the train I'm sweating, I, I, excuse me for the details, I didn't take a shower from Friday, I'm wiped out, I'm undernourished, under, under everything, uh, I couldn't even sleep on the flight, and I'm like, in my last hour, I'm ashamed, just get me home, I just want to sit in air conditioning. So, this guy standing next to me on the platform, he's uh, Ethiopian, 
and he comes to me and he's holding like a smartphone and on the smartphone I see me and he tells me is this you and I'm like yes and he's an Ethiopian Jew he be you know they're they're black he became white and it wasn't that he was like a, a, a religious Jew with a yarmulke, he's a secular, and he's, he cannot believe it. He's like, you're not going to believe it. And he's showing me, me on the, his phone, and he says, I'm watching all sorts of videos on YouTube, and suddenly on the, on the, uh, suggest, excuse me, the suggested ones, when you're looking on a smartphone, it's underneath the video. He's like, your video is like, I see life after death. So I click it and I start watching the video and it's so amazing, I couldn't stop. And he's showing me, look, I'm like half an hour into the video. And, and then I lift up my head and I see you. And I told him, isn't this amazing? Hashem wanted you to listen to the video and he wants you to so much understand what I have to say that he put the star of the video next to you. I told him, now you have to listen to every word that I said in the video. And, and he was shocked. He was shocked. He started taking selfies with me. He's like, nobody will believe me. Nobody will believe me that I'm watching this video and then the guy is standing next to me. And I was like, this is Hashem's way of showing me, you, you know, this entire trip. You are going and you have to touch all these souls. I am not asking you right now what you want to do and if you want to be in air conditioning or not. I'm not asking you right now. This is not the, uh, uh, you know, in Hebrew we say that you filling a request form and I will consider what you want to do. That's how the trip ended. Then this guy is standing on the platform and he's telling me in Hebrew, Zehazui, Zehazui, Zehazui. It's like, this is not normal. It's, this, is, this is unheard of. And then the last thing that I see is I open like somebody gives me like a pamphlet and I read and it's quoting a place in the Zohar how it says that the, the, a person that goes to, to uh, uh, inspire another person and awakens him to Torah and mitzvot, this is the most dearest thing for the, in the eyes of the Kadosh Baruch the, the, the most sensitive part of, the, of Hashem is that another per, one person goes out of his way to wake up another person and to inspire them to do Torah and mitzvot. So it's closed the circle because again, and I'm not a spoiled individual, I, I don't ask the places that call me to come for a lecture. I know some speakers they have a list of demands. First class, a hotel room, you can't take more than three hours of my time. I know, I hear from people what they say, that this speaker charges like this and like that, that speaker demands uh, 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 meals. And I'm very, very not spoiled. I don't ask for anything. And this trip was really, really, Hashem was telling me I'm going to put you through boot camp in this trip. For you to understand that, 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 that it's not about you. It has nothing to do with you. Now, I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about each and every one of us. We have some type of an idea that Hashem, I mean, has to consult with me if I'm comfortable or not. Now, I see it in a very negative way that Hashem is putting me in a situation. I'm seeing it that Hashem is punishing me. Chas Or why am I in this situation? You're in this situation because Hashem wants you to turn something inside out. This is called it hapcha chashochal neora. The Zohar is talking about two motions that I have to do. The first motion is called it kafia, that I have to subdue the evil inclination. I have to subdue my desire. I want to do something, refrain. It's called it kafia, to subdue. And the result is it hapcha. It hapcha is transformed. It hapcha chashochal neora transforming the darkness into light, that's what you have to do. And if I find myself in a situation because Hashem tells me, I need you to do something there. You were hired to fly to that destination to do that job. Instead of me looking up to Hashem and quetching and whining and complaining, I need to understand that Hashem is not even asking me. Hashem is not asking me how or if I'm comfortable, if I want to, if I don't want to. 
Now, as long as I understand that, then I, like a good employee, I go and do it. Or like a good child. I told my kids now, you have chores in the house. The majority of them said, no problem. My father said to do, I'll help. And one of them said, objection. I don't want, I don't agree with your rule. So I said, okay, you can take your objection outside of the house. If you want to object, go find somewhere else to object. In this house, there's no objections. Overrule. I don't care about your objection. You learn from now, when you're four years old, you don't object to the house rules. So, chas I'm not a mean father. I'm not chas I'm torturing my kids. I'm trying to educate them that sometimes there's house rules. Yeah? And... If what? So this is a whole different thing that I want to talk about in the, in the, in the, when I talk about the passport story. You're right, because Hashem wants us to pray. Hashem puts us in situation because He wants me to pray. He wants me to have a connection with Him. And He wants to prove to me how amazing He is. And the thing is that he wants me to initiate a change. I mean, some people can say, you know, I'm not praying for anything, I'm just going to be passive, I'm not going to do anything. So Hashem will put more pressure and more pressure and more pressure, so you will pray. No. So, okay, but, uh, the yeah. short answer, the short answer, because I want to give you the long answer, Bezrat Hashem will do it Tuesday. The short answer is that Hashem has a will. It's called the Ritzon Hashem. And he has a will. When you pray, you change his will. You have the ability to change his will. That's why when we pray, in a lot of the prayers, we say, Yehi Ratzon. Yehi Ratzon, Bifanecha. What it means, Yehi Ratzon? Should be a will. Should be a new will. So Hashem says, my will right now is that you go here. Happens to be that it's tough for me or not so convenient. So I pray. We don't always say but the concept, that's why I told you this is the short version of the answer, is that I pray and I change Hashem's will. And sometimes it's Hashem's will that is not going to be changed. So I have to pray for A, for I want Hashem's will to change, or that at least that if I'm going on a certain path that is going to be how you said, that the strings are not going to hurt too much. But regardless to that, we need to, to take from that I mean, how I feel is when I experience something on myself is so I can psychoanalyze it, chew on it, digest it, and then deliver it to my students. And when I go on a trip, yes, in my mind, at least in the back of my mind, I'm not, go I'm not doing it for myself. I don't enjoy these trips. Even, even before I went on this trip and I kept telling my wife, for three weeks, I don't want to go. I mean, I came back from New York, if you remember, three weeks later exactly was scheduled the trip to Los Angeles. Three weeks, it took me two weeks to get over the jet lag. And I kept telling my wife, I don't want to go. And she was like, what, you don't enjoy these trips? You must enjoy the trips. I told her, I don't enjoy nothing. She was like, yeah, but you hosted in nice houses and, you know, people spoil you. I mean, I, 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 if I want to look at it like that, yeah, I, I, I do get hosted in beautiful places. And every day somebody else wants to treat me, they take me to nice restaurants. But I don't like it. That, that's not the, what convinces me. You know, when my wife told me, you must like something. It can't be that you don't like anything in the strips. So my answer was very superficial. I told her, you know what, I actually do like something in the strips. I rent a nice car. <laughs> so, because <laughs> I travel with so many boxes. And we have CDs and books and pamphlets and flyers and the suitcases. I always rent a nice big SUV and I, uh, that's, that's, my, that's my weakness, the cars. So I told her, it is, yeah, I do like one thing, is the cars. But I really don't like these trips. So the point is that I always try to find in between the lines what's for me to learn there. It's not only me going and teaching. It's also for me to learn something. And this trip, the, the, the character trait of the trip, what kept repeating it itself is Hashem is saying, in an, it was echoing in my system that I am not asking you or consulting with you if you are happy or not or comfortable or not. 
I'm not an airline company that will ask you if you want an aisle seat or a window seat. And I'm not a restaurant that will give you a menu, you can choose the veal, the, the, the chicken or the fish. I'm telling you what to do. So that applies to all of us because we all run into all these tsarot, how you say, you know, you say problems in Hebrew? Tsarot. Tsuris. Tsara. And I call it a tsara. But tsuris. This is a, with, a, with, with, a, with the accent. It's, in Hebrew you say tsarot, and in the Ashkenaz accent you say tsuris. So tsara has the letters of tzadik, resh, hey. Really it's us that is reading it wrong. It's really ratza, resh tzadik, hey. Same letters, just a different uh, order. Ratza means he wants, Hashem wants, that's what Hashem wants. I'm looking at it as a tsara, as a problem. The, pro the, 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 the thing is that the, the problem is in me, not in Hashem. So the, what I took from that and what I take from that and what I give over is that Hashem is really not asking us. I have to be a good soldier, a good student and say to Hashem, that's what you want. Let me do it the best way possible. And if I do it the best way possible and I accept that that's the will of Hashem and I don't cry, whine or, or complain all day long, then the problem kind of wears down. It's not so bad. More than that, it allows Hashem to operate. Because when I think that I can control something, I have zero control. You know that when I landed in uh, Los Angeles, I'll tell you one more story, short story, is that my flight got delayed going out of Israel. So I landed later in Los Angeles. I go to the car rental place, I walk in and I tell her I have a reservation. She tells me, we can't give you a car. I said, but I have a reservation. She says, but you're late. I told her, what do you mean I'm late? <laughs> I told her, the, I, I, did you look at the reservation that I'm coming from a different country? That's a very natural thing that flights get delayed. I mean, what did you do? You sold the car? What do you mean I'm late? What kind of a rental company is that you're late? No, we have to charge you a penalty. I said, so okay, so, so tell me you want to charge me more money. Don't tell me I'm late. Long story short, she's like, really, we don't have the car for you. So she was like, but we can upgrade you to a better car, which will cost you an additional. I said, ah, so just tell me you're trying to upgrade me now to a much more expensive car. Long story short, it started on the wrong foot and with the with the with the girl there and in my mind already oh now no car now it's going to be more expensive and long story short i ah then fi finally somehow she changed her tone she became nice because I, I said some nice words i wasn't tr treating her with disrespect or anything like many many people do so suddenly she became a good friend Okay, finally we, we located the right car. Then I come with my credit card and today's credit cards, they have this chip. So we put the chip and she was like, what's your passport? Pa password. I don't know what's my password. I never use a password. So you can't use the card. Okay, bring another card. Okay, that card also has the chip. Okay, so all the cards had this chip. So they tried to, to to fake the system, so what they do is they put the card the other way around, so it says error, card error, they do it three times, then it says swipe card. So they're trying to, to, to jig the system. So what it did, it flagged in the credit card company like a weird transaction, so they canceled all, all my credit cards got uh, blocked. So, I mean, everything that, went, that can go wrong, went wrong. So now I tell her, okay, so I have a debit card. I have an American debit card. We don't accept debit cards. I said, there's money there. Charge the card. So she says, okay, so show me a return ticket. I said, okay. And I pull up my phone. I was like, I don't have internet here. Do you have Wi-Fi? No. And I was like, so how am I going to show you my return ticket? Long story short, she was really nice. She was like, here, uh, I'll make a hotspot with my phone. She ended up being very, very helpful. And in the end, everything worked out. We paid and, and I got the car. But the point is that Hashem puts us a, a situation and I have zero 
a, a power. I can't do anything. She told me, what's the password, password for the credit card? I don't know. I have zero power here. I, she's like, maybe you can call. I mean, who am I going to call? Who am I going to call? To ask, I'm going to call my rabbi. Hey, rabbi, do you know my, the password, password of my credit card? I told her, nobody knows the password of my credit card. So, what? Not even. Not even me? Call the bank. You think the bank knows my password? So, and Hashem is basically telling me you have zero, zero power here. The more you subdue, then I'll, I'll, I'll take the charge. And the second that I did that, then Hashem made her nice. She was not nice in the beginning. Probably a different Jew with a long beard and a black yarmulke did, did behave disgusting and she didn't want to help me. And Baruch Hashem, she suddenly became very, very helpful to a point that she was so helpful, she did everything and everything possible to get me the car. And which, that was the proof that Hashem says, you have zero power here. I have the power. Give me the power and I will operate. That's when I give in. If I think that I have power to do something, then Hashem says, okay, you do it. Let's see you, let's see you do it. By saying, Hashem, I, have, I don't know what to do here. What do you want? I'm giving you 100% power here. Hashem, who I look him. You do it. I told Hashem, I, that's what I did. I did a 30 second Hidbo de Dut. I said out loud in front of 50 people, it was a car, car rental place, 10 cashiers, 50 people there. I stopped and I said out loud, Hashem, what do you want? You came, I came here to give lectures. I need to carry all my suitcases. You find a solution. I said it out loud in my words, Hashem, you presented the problem, you bring the solution. I don't care that people think I'm crazy or not. They're looking like, who's he talking to? This, this weird guy with the long beard is talking to... I said, I'm talking to angels. And I'm telling Hashem, Hashem, this is your problem. I'm just, I'm just an employee here. You have to worry about the vehicle, not me. The, the responsibility for the vehicle is you, not me. So. The second that I gave the power to Hashem by saying, Hashem, this is your problem. It's not my problem. You want? I'll stay here. You don't want me to have a car? I'll camp in the car rental place. I have food here to last till the evening and I have clothes. I have no problem. I'm glad to make a U-turn and to go home. That's when Hashem says, okay, if you're glad to go home, you're not going home. Here's a car. So when you give power to the Kadosh Baruch Hu, then He makes things work. So the point to take is very simple, that Hashem is the one who controls the, the, everything. He's holding the reins. And you just have to follow on the tracks of Hashem and not to have one moment of saying, wait a minute, you didn't consult me. You didn't ask me my opinion. If I'm stopping to say Hashem, you didn't ask my opinion, okay, you'll stay another week in America. What? You mean when we protest? If you protest, if you complain, if you quetch, if you whine, if you say Hashem, I don't deserve it. Hashem says, I, I booked your tour. You do what I tell you to do. If we apply this to our day-to-day -day life, that Hashem is in control, if we give Him the control, trust me, He knows what He's doing. Sometimes the ride is going to be a little bit bumpy, but He knows what's good for me. And I have to go through this ride. And the more that I subdue myself and I say, Hashem, okay, you, you run the show however you want to show, then I'm, I know at least I'm going on the right path. The point to take to that, that is not to have chas v'shalom, the chutzpah of saying, Hashem, you're not consulting with me. I don't like your decision. I don't like this and that. And when we don't do that, that's when Hashem puts me on the right path. Yes, it's not going to be so comfortable always. But it's the path that Hashem wants me to go on. And obviously I have to do a few things there. And that's the will of the Kadosh Baruch Hu. And as other Hashem, we should always fulfill the will of the Kadosh Baruch Hu, And that His will should be our will. And that we can fulfill it, that our will should be His will. And as other Hashem, Hashem's will should be to send us Mashiach, that we don't have to go to America anymore and be uh, in hurricanes. And we can stay here and enjoy this holy, beautiful place.